Greetings, Earth. Welcome to the Nostalgiaverse. Hello and welcome. I am Kat, your host, as always, and with me is Alex. Hello. And Steve. Hello. Today we've got a special guest who hails from the writing side of things, Buzz Disc Dixon. How are you? Thank you, Kat. You've done a lot of of writing for comic books and cartoon series. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. Over the years. How how did all of that get started for you? Well, the short answer is I walked through the doors of Filmation Studios about five minutes after the producer said, we need to get another staff writer in fast. Uh, <laughs> that's a short <laughs> version. The, what it, it happened was I, mean, I had been in the Army. I was drafted back in 1972. By the time I got out in 78, I wanted to go to film school at USC, but I was discharged at around February of 78. And the USC film school didn't start until fall. So I thought, well, I'll come to Los Angeles. I'll get a job at a studio is like in the mail room or a driver or something like that. So that I just get my feet wet, get a little bit of experience. And I, I literally started at the top and worked my way down, went to every employment office at every studio with my resume. And I happened to work my way down, and I'm not exaggerating when I say I must have dropped my resume off at close to 100 places. It, it was a large number of, of studios I went to. I went to AIP, and I never had a chance to meet Samuel Z. Arkov, but I could hear him screaming obscenities in the next room. So that's, uh, <laughs> that's my, oh my brush goodness. with greatness there. But <laughs> Brilliant. Anyway, I finally worked my way down to Filmation Studios, and for people who are not aware, Filmation, it wasn't the bottom level of animation in America at the time, but it was it was close. You could see the bottom from Filmation Studios. Wow. And they were, were very low budget. Mm -hmm. The operating philosophy was that they would never do what was called negative financing. They would never put you know, they would never borrow money to put into a production and hope to make it back in reruns. They would make it for whatever the budget was, and they would cut corners like nobody's business. Oh, yeah. uh, so okay. they were like incredibly cheap when it came to animation. But the strong side was they realized if they had good writing, that it would make up for deficits in the animation. So they were always looking for writing staff. In any yeah. case, I, uh, I went around to drop off my resume, and when I go into the reception area, they asked me, well, is this, are you looking for a job in animation or live action? Because they also did live action. Well, I'm right. thinking, I, I don't know anything about animation, so I said live action. And she took the resume back, and she said, Arthur, and that would be Arthur Nadell, who was their live action producer, said, mm -hmm. Arthur said, come back, and he'll, he'll talk with you. Well, I mean, Arthur was... They were in a period called hiatus, which is between the end of production on one season before they pick up shows for the next season. So that's like a three to four month period where you're just pretty much cooling your heels and you're, you're doing whatever little projects come your way. Arthur didn't have anything to do. So, yeah, break up the afternoon, bring the guy in. Let me talk to him. So mm -hmm. Arthur, and Arthur was just a sweet guy. I have to say, really nice, sweet guy. Arthur and I were talking and, you know, he asked about my background and I explained I had been in the army. I had been a newspaper editor for the army. I had written short stories, though I had never sold any. If you have any short stories, send them to me. I'd be happy to take a look at them. Well, I happened to have them packed in my suitcase because, you know, at that time we didn't have a lot of property to be schlepping around. So right. I go home, I dig out a couple of the short stories, I take them to Arthur, and when I gave them to Arthur, he mentioned, we're working on a, a series, and we're having some trouble coming up with story ideas. And he said, now I can't ask you to write a story idea, but if you happen to write a story idea, and it happened to end up on my desk, I could take a look at it. Well, you know, I realized you, gotta, you can't go 100% by the rules, you know, when you're starting out. So, okay, fine, I go home and I... I worked up a batch of story ideas for the, this um, show that they had that they were having problems with. About a week later, I came back. I dropped the story ideas off with them. What I did not know was that between the time I gave him the short stories 
and mm -hmm. I came back with the um, story ideas for the, the show, he had read my short stories and he had FedExed them to Hawaii where Lou Scheimer, who was the producer of, of you know, one of the co-owners of Filmation Studios, mm -hmm. he was on vacation in Hawaii. So he had sent my short stories to Lou by FedEx, which in 1978 was a big deal. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's it's, it's yeah. not big now, but back then, wow, you know. Especially to um, Hawaii. Oh, my gosh. Exactly. Yeah. So he sent it to Lou in Hawaii. And then when Lou came back, he had read, Arthur had read the story pitches that I had come up with. And he left the story pitches on Lou's desk. And Lou came back and he saw my story pitches. And he contacted Arthur, pushed the button on the intercom. And he said, Arthur, I, I like these story ideas, but I don't know who we should hire. I don't know if we should hire the guy that did the story ideas or the guy who wrote the short stories you sent me. And Arthur said, they're the same guy. And Lou said, get him. And <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, the next thing I know is, uh, would, would you like to write a script for us? And I said, sure. And I wrote a script. I'll, I'll do a little sidebar here for a moment. Many years later, I found that script in my uh, files and good Lord, is it awful. It is, it is terrible. If I had a, somebody gave me this as a sample script, I would never hire the person. But you know, <laughs> Filmation at the time, they were willing to take chances on people. And they had a really good writing. I'll throw a few names out for you. They had a guy named Bill Danch who went all the way back to radio. I mean, he was, oh, one, of the, he was one of the original writers on the Fibber McGee and Molly show. They had story editing team of Len Jansen and Chuck Mendel. They had done pixelated animated films. They did a thing called Savage Cycles or something like that, where they, they played a motorcycle gang, only they didn't have motorcycles. They posed as if they were riding motorcycles, and then they animated themselves zooming up and down the road. They were riding on motorcycles and whatnot. They were my story editors. They were the ones I dealt with the most. But another writer who was hired at just about the same time and under very similar circumstances was a guy named Sam Simon. Oh. You may know Sam from a little thing called The Simpsons. Yeah. yeah. He was one of the originators. He was one of the original uh, producers on The Simpsons. So we, this was the, the quality of writing they had. I mean, I, there was another writer named Jerry Boudreaux who had been writing for comics for Warren Publications for a long time. And he did a number of episodes for us. There were any number of freelancers who were, you know, drifting in and out of the studio. I met a lot of people that I know to this day and I'm still friends with the first time working there. Now, Harlan Ellison came in one time to uh, pitch a story idea to him, an animated film to him. And uh, we ended up hanging around with Harlan and, uh, you know, just having a great time. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's all these people that I met for the first time at Filmation Studios. And as I said, we, it was basically my, my schooling because by the end of summer, I was making, you know, fairly good money writing animation. And I had a choice of either quitting the job and going to school or staying and writing and getting paid for it. And I figured, well, I can put off school for a year or two and a year or two became a year or five. And then at a certain point you recognize, well, there's really no point in going to school now, is there? Because you've got a career. So <laughs> right. um, you know, I ended up uh, going from the Army into animation writing, and that led me to where I am now. Hmm. True what they've said in many an interview with people that have worked with Filmation has been the springboard for so many careers within the animation industry. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The more cynical expression in the studio was there were two types of people that Filmation hired, those on their way in and those on their way out. We had a few people who were old timers who just could not get work anymore. And Lou and Arthur, out of the goodness of their heart, would throw them some work and whatnot. We had a colorist, Irv Kaplan, I think, is, if I'm remembering correctly who was also a part-time Playboy cartoonist. He would do these, not individual cartoons, but he would do like three or four page set of themed cartoons for them. And, you know, maybe do this like once or twice a year. But, you know, hey, Playboy at the time, that was a, was a big prestigious gig. Um, mm -hmm. He had a job as the, the colorist. He was the color director for the studio. The knee slapper is he was colorblind. So when you look oh at all the goodness. old Filmation stuff, it's all green and purple. Well, that's 
the only colors he could see, you know. Oh my <laughs> that does explain a lot. Wow. <laughs> they were wonderful, nice people. They were very friendly. They were generous in a limited way. I mean, they made no bones about the fact we are going to do this as close to the budget as we possibly can. We're going we're to keep this down because they viewed reruns as pure gravy and they were going to make their money back. They were going to make a profit off of the initial run. And as a result, they innovated. They did a lot of stuff that later on other people picked up and copied. Tarzan, they did a lot of rotoscoping and then they would just change the animation by changing the costume on the rotoscope. I remember they had a, a brush up with, I think it was the CBS sensors. One season they had Tarzan fighting, um, I forget what, what he was fighting, but the, the costumes they put on him were one kind of character. The next season he was fighting Roman centurions. And all they did was, you know, just change the costume on the rotoscoping. And CBS said, oh, we can't do this. It's too violent. They said, what are you talking about? It's the exact same animation you approved last year. It's just a different costume. But we had, you know, it was it was a very interesting place. You got experience there. They pioneered for television motion control photography, which had <clears throat> motion control photography was not invented for Star Wars, but Star Wars used it far more than anybody else had ever used it before. What happened was Lou was reading about this because, you know, they were doing various low budget shows like Arc 2, Shazam and Isis. Uh, I'll tell you a funny story about Isis in a second. And when Lou found out it cost a thousand dollars less a minute to film special effects than it did to do live action. That's when Space Academy and Jason of Star Command came up. That's why they were heavy special effects shows. It was actually a thousand dollars cheaper to have spaceships zooming around than it was to have actors talking to each other. Lou goes, okay, yeah, just load it up. You launch all the rockets you want. Just go right ahead. <laughs> the ISIS show was interesting. A friend of mine, a guy named uh, Michael Reeves, who is a novelist and an animation writer and screenwriter and a wide variety of things. Arthur fell in love with Michael's approach to ISIS because Michael figured out ISIS could make things not happen. Bridge, do not collapse. Damn, do not burst. All of a sudden, the scope of the show expanded immeasurably. I mean, you can make anything not happen. Sun, don't go Nova. You know, I mean, it was just incredible. He could, he could do all these wild shows. Didn't cost him a penny. Arthur loved him for that. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> it's amazing the things that you, you end up with when you put multiple people together and go, let's see what we can do with this and what we don't need to do that we can do more of. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing what you come up with. But there's a movie where Gary Marshall is playing a soap opera producer mm -hmm. and he's talking to, I forget who it is he's talking to. It may have been Sally Field, but he was, he was talking to someone who was supposed to be the story editor. It was Tootsie. Mm -hmm. And he's mm. talking to the story editor of the series and he says, he's talking about this plot line they had done where there was, they had hired dozens of extras to be these famine stricken people and whatnot. And he said, you know what I don't like? Depressing and expensive. I don't like that. You know what I do like? Fun and cheap. That was essentially Lou Scheimer's approach to things. You know, if, if you can find mm -hmm. a way to do it fun and cheap, I mean, if you watch the old shows, you can, and you know what you're looking for, you will see examples of this popping up all over the place. Mm -hmm. Nobody turns on camera. They always go off panel and then come back in the opposite direction because it's difficult to animate a character turning. And it was just a lot cheaper to have them go off panel, hear a screech, and then they come back in the opposite direction. She shows that they did, they would do as many dialogue scenes over the shoulder of the person talking. So you would have Mr. Weatherby talking to Archie and you know, you've just got every now and then Archie blinks an eye as Mr. Weatherby is talking to him. You don't see Mr. Weatherby's mouth because his back is to the camera. And then when Archie answers, you flip it around and Mr. Weatherby blinks while Archie's talking to him. It was just astonishingly cheap stuff that they would do. And they were determined to stretch that budget out. They did the mm -hmm. Fat Albert series and they relied so heavily on stock footage. Mm -hmm. 
Hmm. They would give writers on shows that had been on a season or more, like Tarzan or Fat Albert, they would give them a big, thick binder with all the stock footage scenes, the storyboards of the stock footage scenes, and they would tell them, go through here and call specific stock footage out. So if you say they're chasing, call out a specific chase that we have stock footage for. Don't ask for something brand new. And mm -hmm. you were expected to do that. Go through there and plot out what kind of actions to do based on what they already have. The last four Fat Alberts, they did. They had no new animation in it whatsoever. Everything was stock footage. That's wild, because I used to watch the Fat Albert cartoon. Yeah. That's wild. Yeah. Takes on a whole new meaning nowadays, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, it does. <laughs> that, it, it so does. Amazing to be able to talk to somebody who was involved in, in a lot of that and knows kind of the inside you know, scoop of some of the things that went on in the, the in the 70s and 80s and and 90s and and how they did things and then you yeah. go back and you look at it and you're like oh yeah okay now i see what he's talking about and it's like yeah. oh wow <laughs> looking at your imdb it looks like the the first thing that's listed i don't know if it's imdb is not entirely accurate but the first thing listed is tarzan and the super seven yeah, there is no way to configure that show and come up with the number seven. It was just a snappy title that they had, and they stuck it on there. They had, and in fact, this goes back to the story ideas that I developed for Arthur. They mm -hmm. had, well, I guess like Super Friends. If I remember correctly, Super Friends would have a big story that involved all the characters, but then they would have little individual stories. They'd have a Batman-only story or a Superman-only mm -hmm. story. And yeah. Tarzan and the Super 7 had Tarzan as one anchor. That They were doing the reruns of the old Tarzan cartoons, cut down to like 17 minutes mm -hmm. from, from 22 down to 17. And I think they were doing Space Academy or Star Academy, whatever they were calling it at the time. That was the other anchor at the other end of the show. And in between, they were going to do these individual segments. Mm -hmm. And they had, um, I may forget all the characters. They had Manta and Moray, which were two underwater superheroes. They yeah. had Super Stretch and Micro Woman, which, as you can guess, basically the Wasp and Plastic Man. They had Web Woman, who was basically Spider-Man crossed with Black Widow from Marvel. Well, th this is all going to come to play in a moment. Let me let me do the setup yeah. for you. They did another group, and I can't remember what they were called, but basically it was all the heroes of mythology plus a couple that we created. There was Super <laughs> Samurai, there was Aladdin, there was a couple of others, and uh, they were time-traveling superheroes who would go to different eras and solve whatever problems occurred. Somehow this all was supposed to enumerate up to seven. So you have Tarzan and seven other what's. Well, you didn't have seven segments. Okay, fine. You don't have seven segments. Well, then maybe it's the characters. Whoops, no, we've got far too many than seven characters. And we, we tried there. We kept trying, honest to goodness, to figure out how it comes out to seven. We could never, ever come up with a configuration that justified the number seven. And Lou said, ah, we don't care. Sounds great, and uh, we've already got the titles done, so we're not changing. <laughs> the show that I started out, the one, the original ideas that I did for Arthur, was for a series, and I, I may get the exact names wrong, but it's close enough that if, if I'm wrong, I'm remembering closely enough. It was going to be called something like um, Starlight and Sunbright or something like that. And the premise was you had... Uh, well, I'll back up a little bit. The original premise was there are identical twin girls. The blonde has the powers, superpowers in the daytime, and the brunette has superpowers at night. And mm -hmm. they switch, you know, at sunup and sundown, having these superpowers, which is not, you know, not a, a terrible idea. It's actually kind of interesting because it, it puts... Mm -hmm puts a timer on you, so to speak, where you've, you've got to do something by a certain time. My first contribution was, well, they can't be identical twins. And they said, why not? Because identical twins will have the same hair color. 
you know, they can be fraternal twins, but not identical twins. So my one big contribution was getting them to change identical to fraternal in the, um, the, the show Bible. Mm-hmm. And we tried coming up with story ideas, and they could never come up with anything that anybody was interested in doing. And I think I had tried like four ideas, and nobody, none of them caught fire with anybody. The mm-hmm. one idea that came closest, I almost introduced sex to Saturday morning television because <laughs> um, said, I want to do a story where they're chasing a unicorn. And one of the girls is going to find it impossible to get anywhere close to the unicorn. And the other one's going to be able to catch it quite easily. Nobody at the time realized I was making the reference that only a virgin can catch a unicorn. And right. that came the closest to actually being done. But after about like four or five failures to get any kind of a script approved, they just said, you know, this isn't working. We'll just scrap it and we'll do more episodes of the other characters. We did these other shows and we promptly proceeded to get the daylight sued out of us by Marvel and DC. Somebody linked, I don't know if they leaked the original costume design, but Marvel, when they heard Web Woman, immediately filed a protest that this is too much like Spider-Man. And I guess somebody sent them picture of the character in costume said no 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 it doesn't look like spider-man at all and marvel goes you're right it looks like black widow now we're really ticked and and so they had to end up changing what had been a very logical and pragmatic kind of a costume a a kind of tight-fitting jumpsuit with pockets and a utility belt and whatnot gets changed into a leotard and tights and it's like now she just looks generic and dumb yeah but we ended up doing several episodes of that super stretch and micro woman we managed to get sued by both marvel and dc for allegedly ripping off elastic man on dc's part and mr fantastic on marvel's part told Filmation's lawyer, look, why don't you just tell DC and Marvel to go and decide who is being ripped off? Just deal with one of them. He managed, he's the only guy I know who managed to lose two lawsuits to two different claimants to the same character. Uh, He pulled that one off. Manta and Moray, I know they had made complaints about it, but I guess they figured, you know, at that point, can't squeeze blood out of a turnip or, or anything like that. Filmation had like the worst luck with lawyers and with rights because shortly after we had done Tarzan and the Super 7, we did another series called The Fabulous Funnies, which Uh was based on comic strips. One of the comic strips that they had the rights to or they told us they had the rights to was a Western comic strip called Tumbleweeds. Here, I'll give you an example of how Filmation thought as cheaply as possible. I was a big fan of the Tumbleweed strip, and I I said, I want to, let me write some for you. And they said, great, but don't use any of the Indian characters. I said, well, why not? And he says, well, we get into trouble if we use non-ethnic actors to play ethnic characters and just can't afford to hire anybody, you know, other than our regular staff of, uh, or regular group of voice actors. Uh-huh. And I said, but but you've got two characters who are Indians in the comic strip who are both mute. They don't speak at all. One of them communicates by writing notes, and the other one is just this big dumb guy who never says anything. And they said, oh well, great. If you if you can write two characters that don't say anything, you can include them. Put lots of luck and bucolic buffalo. That was the name of the two characters. They ended up in the script had written at least two scripts because uh, we had one that was animated and it was in the premiere episode and we had a second one that was in production and the day after the premiere episode aired because it aired on a Sunday morning for some reason the day after mm-hmm. it aired the lawyer for Tom Ryan who was a cartoonist for Tumbleweeds you know calls up and said gee you know Tom liked what you did thought it was good He's just wondering why you never bothered to sign a contract with him. And what had happened was they had asked their lawyer, you know, get the rights to Tumbleweeds. 
And the lawyer calls Ryan and Ryan said, well, show me what you plan to do with it. And if I like it, I'll say, okay, meaning send him a sample script, send him a storyboard. Right. And the lawyer comes back. He's okay with it. Then forgot about following up and never followed up and got a contract with. And oh so we, goodness. we not only animated a cartoon, we had him featured prominently in the uh, opening credits that, that ended up getting dropped and changed and whatnot. You can wow. find that on Google, if not Google, excuse me, strike that YouTube. If you look for it, somebody has uploaded the the only videotape copy still in existence, and it's on Google, uh, YouTube. I keep saying Google, uh, mm. but you know, and that was unfortunately fairly typical because in their in their determination to save money, they frequently ended up in situations where it cost them a lot more money. Oops. <laughs> yeah. Oops. Uh, oops was the operative word there. Yeah. Yeah. Following Tarzan and Super 7, we'll kind of go through the next couple here. New Adventures of Mighty Mouse and Heckle and Jekyll. Mm -hmm. uh, new Schmoo, Plastic Man Comedy Adventure Show. Mm -hmm. And Heathcliff. Heathcliff. Yeah. Heathcliff was the character you got when you couldn't afford Garfield. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And then you did 21 episodes of Thundar the Barbarian. Mm. I didn't write 21 episodes. You get, you had a gang credit on the Ruby Spears shows. One of the things that enabled Lou to get good writers was that he gave writing credits on all the shows that he did. As a result, people wanted to write for him because then they could say, ah, this specific episode is mine. Here's my name on the credits. And that could help them get another gig. For Ruby Spears and Hanna-Barbera, you would have a gang credit at the end of, of all the animators who worked on, on any episode of the show, all the storyboard mm -hmm. artists, and all the writers. So it would not be unusual to see anywhere from six to 12 names on the writing staff, and mm -hmm. that could reflect six people who split the work among themselves fairly evil, evenly, or it could reflect one guy who did almost all the work, 11 freelancers who, who pitched ideas that then had to be, you know, drastically rewritten. You didn't get an accurate idea of who wrote what in those episodes. And uh, unless you remember specifically titles and whatnot of episodes that you did, I know I did the, the werewolf story. I know I did Wizard War. Mm -hmm. I did the story that was the backdoor pilot with the three time-traveling females in it. Any Thundar episode where there was a reference to Slime Boy, I did mm -hmm. that. I did the one where Treasure the Mocks, I did that one. Past that, I couldn't tell you exactly which ones I wrote and which ones I didn't wrote. I'd have to look at it, and a lot of times, even if I looked at it, I'd go, well, you know, maybe I worked on that. Maybe I did a rewrite on it for somebody else. Maybe I wrote it entirely by myself. It's hard over the years to remember each and every episode that you wrote. I mean, I've looked oh, yeah. at my IMBD list and uh, IMDb, yeah. IMDb list, and I, I look at it and I go, wow, I don't remember working on that show. <laughs> I would go and check because I said, well, maybe somebody got it wrong. Maybe they put my name on the show and then, whoop, no, there's my name in the credits. Son of a gun. I guess I did something. It's a complete blank. Well, I mean, Thundar, this is like 1980, 1981. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of back there a little bit. It sticks in my memory because, first off, there were so many lifelong friends that I have worked with me on that show. Mm. Um, and I met so many great people. I met Gil Kane through that. I met Jack Kirby. I mean, I'll tell you the story about meeting Jack Kirby. Uh, Steve Gerber, okay? Mm -hmm. Before Thundar, Steve had come to work as a story editor at Ruby Spears, and, and Steve and I, you know, struck it off. We became good friends. We hung around a lot. And when we were doing Thundar, Steve had told Joe Ruby, he says, I know a couple of artists, one in particular, who'd be perfect for this. And Joe said, well, send them around. So we were having the first official production meeting for Thundar. I knew Steve had said, I'm going to have somebody I know who uh, would be good for this come and, and attend the meeting and apply some art ideas. 
So I go into the meeting and when I arrive, I'm the third person there. When I get into the conference room. John Dorman, who was the head of the storyboard department, was there, and he was already talking with this older man. The older man, this is one of the only people I've ever met where you say, if somebody has a twinkle in their eye, I mean, you literally mean a twinkle. His eyes were just sparkling. He and John were talking, and they were clearly getting along really well, and I sat down and John said, you know, he said we might be able to do this with Thundar. And I go, oh, well, that does sound good. And so I started talking with him, but John did not introduce us to each other. He assumed we knew each other. And so we started talking and I thought, well, this guy, hey, he's really sharp. He's got some great ideas. And then one by one, other people drifted into the room and nobody ever started the meeting by saying, well, let's just introduce ourselves all the way around so we all know who we are. We had eight to 10 people in the room, production people, layout artists, writers, myself. Mm -hmm. And we were all talking and just developing ideas. And this kind of a thing, you're just spitballing ideas. Somebody throws one idea out, another person develops it and says, well, yeah, we could do that. And then we could do this thing to it. And then it just grows. And you're expected Mm -hmm. to do that. Everybody's contributing ideas. And the old guy was just, I mean, he was like a never-ending font, uh, fount of, of just great ideas. Mm-hmm. And as I said, we were getting along personally. I mean, in, in a personal rapport with one another, we, we clearly liked each other. We were uh, respectful of each other's abilities. When the meeting ended, he said, I'll go back to my studio and I'll start drawing some of these things up. And Joe said, great, we can't wait to see him. So everybody else went back to their respective offices and whatnot. And I remember going into Steve's office. He was the story editor. Went into Steve's mm-hmm. office and said, you know what? I'm, I'm really looking forward to working on this show. It sounds like it's going to be tons of fun. And I said, that old guy, man, I mean, I was astonished. He is really on the ball. I can't wait to work with him on some of these episodes. And mm-hmm. Steve said, that was Jack Kirby. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, don't ah. what? <laughs> I mean, I had never seen a picture of Jack Kirby. I knew who he was by reputation. I had never seen right. a photo of him. You know, I tell people, if, if I had known it was Jack Kirby, my contribution to the meeting would have been... <laughs> <laughs> it's, about, it's That's about the usual reaction to a, to a legend like that. It's like, die. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm not worthy moment. Yeah, exactly. You know, I I tell people Jack Kirby and I became friends before I knew Jack Kirby was Jack Kirby. (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome. And it it, it, it happens that way sometimes, too. It's like, oh, my gosh. Yeah. That's 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 funny. Yeah. Following looks like in eighty one, Goldie Gold and Action Jack. Oh, my God. There's an episode Um, of that. Yeah. This is the way suits think. And we can't blame this one on Joe Ruby because the idea, he was told to develop the idea by ABC. ABC had Richie Rich on, and and Richie Rich, I think at the time was like their most successful show. Yeah. And they had Richie Rich in the comic books is like six to eight years old, but they had aged him up to about 12 so he was he had not yet reached puberty okay and that's important right if you read the richie rich comics the joke is richie has so much money it is physically hard to handle it they've got warehouses full of money all over the place they are buying the most ridiculously expensive junk they can just to get the money out of the house and mm-hmm. it's a joke that, that they have so much money. That there's just it, It's a problem dealing with b- big wheelbarrows of money all the time. And if you're six to eight years old, your idea of what to do with billions and billions of dollars has a certain amount of innocence to it. Right. And even if you're 12, but you haven't discovered the opposite sex yet, or your own sex, if that's the way you're oriented, if, right. you, if you haven't discovered sex yet, if you haven't hit puberty, you still have kind of an innocent childlike approach to money. Mm-hmm. The moment you hit puberty, the moment you become a teenager and started to cross the threshold into adult life, money takes on an entirely different meaning. Yeah. And they wanted to do a show where there was a teenage girl who was like Richie Rich, had all the money in the world. 
no visible parents, and there was a mentor. Originally, Action Jack was supposed to be like a older adventurer relative, like uh, Indiana Jones, but they kept cutting his age down until finally he got to be pretty much a contemporary of, of Goldie's. The idea was that you've got this fabulously wealthy teenage girl with Indiana Jones as her uncle, and they go and have adventures. That's not the same kind of story and appeal that Richie Rich has. And by the time they finished mucking about with it, and they end up having this kind of quasi-romance going on, and they never explain where the parents are, and there are no adult guardians to say, wait a minute, don't do that, this is dangerous, something like that. The show had taken on like really bizarre aspects. It was, I remember getting into an argument with somebody and saying, they wanted to do a show where Goldie and Action Jack are running down the alley being chased by somebody, and they encounter a homeless guy who happens to be one of Goldie's best friends. And I, I remember saying to the network person, whoa, wait a minute, why would she know a homeless guy in the alley? Knowing a homeless guy, I believe that. Having him still be homeless five minutes after you met him, when you've got billions and billions of dollars, no, he would not be homeless. What kind of a friend would let somebody live in an alley when they right. have billions of dollars and they could, they could easily afford a place for him? Oh, well, he likes living in cardboard boxes. And so, no, God bless, no, that's not what this is at all. And they just refused to listen. They just thought you could shoehorn these gags into those characters and it would work. And in the end, we decided, well, we just have to make this the most ridiculous thing we possibly can. We just have to go so far over the top that, you know, nobody could take it seriously enough to accuse us of being indifferent to the way that she would spend money. I raised more than a few hackles when I said, come on, teenage girl without any parents around, without any guardian to slow her down, she's got billions of dollars, she'll be dead by a drug overdose in eight months. Let's let's be honest, we've got to have something. And, oh, no, 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 they don't have drugs. <laughs> you, can, you can get away with a six-year-old boy having billions of dollars and spending it on innocent things. By the time you yeah. hit your teens, you've got too much self-awareness. Yeah. And uh, Joe Ruby tried to make the show as good as he could. and But Joe just had these moments where he would be... When he and Ken Spears were a writing team, and they were the guys that basically created Scooby-Doo. So they've got mm -hmm. legitimate chops as writers. But the way they would work, would Ken would just let... Joe spew out ideas all day long. And then at the end of the day, he would take all the notes and he would type them up and he would try to arrange them in some way that made sense. And a lot of times that meant throwing out stuff that was just nonsensical, but uh, at least they would have something that they could show that made some kind of sense. So you might say that Ken was more of the editorial aspect and Joe was more of the creative aspect. Right. When they got to be producers, Ken was fobbed off with the actual physical production problems. And Joe was allowed complete freedom creatively. And so we would have these story meetings where the writing staff and the animators and whatnot be in Joe's office. Joe would be just talking about, can we do this? Can we do that? And whatnot. And there was a um, storyboard artist who became a writer and then an animation director, uh, Gordon Kent, passed away just a couple of years ago. Gordon and I were good friends at the time. Mm -hmm. Gordon came into a meeting one time, and he just didn't want to have any part of this. It was a Goldie Gold meeting, and he didn't want any part of it. So he sat on the couch behind the armchair that I was sitting in. This is Joe's office we're in. And I'm in a big winged armchair. Gordon's a tiny little guy, and I'm pretty hefty. And so he's sitting behind me, and he just takes a nap. He just closes his eyes and goes to sleep, and he lets Joe blather on, and he lets other people talk, and he's just napping back there. And so we're talking about the script that we're doing, the pilot episode, and Joe says, okay, and when they're going down the snowbank, they're being chased by the bad guys on skis down the snowbank, can we have a giant squid erupt out of the snowbank and attack them? And Gordon woke up just at that moment, and he says, yes, we can, but who would want to? And there was like dead silence in the room. And Joe started turning red. And I laughed. 
and everybody else laughed, and Joe decided to interpret it as a joke. But damn it, from that point on, that giant squid was in the script. There was no way it was not going to be in the script. So we, we animate the pilot episode, and it airs with the giant squid erupting out of the snowbank to attack Goldie Gold and Action Jack. When the show was reviewed by a parents magazine, the opening of the review, and I swear to God, this is what it said, the opening of the review was, we suppose it's possible to animate a giant squid coming out of a snowbank, but who would want to? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is funny. <laughs> well, that is hysterically funny. <laughs> hey, great minds think alike. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Now, you mentioned Sco Scooby, so, it's, so the mm -hmm. next thing on the list is Scooby and Scrappy Doo's Puppy Hour from 82. That's one of those shows that I'm, I'm going to take your word on it. I had something to do with it. I don't know if there was a segment that was a non-Scooby segment that we had something to do with or if mm -hmm. something for them or what. At the time, Ruby Spears was having financial difficulties and to, to keep going, they would hire out their staff for other people's shows. Mm -hmm. And so I worked on a number of Hanna-Barbera shows even though I was drawing a Ruby Spears paycheck. But mm -hmm. they basically just hired us out to, to write shows for, for Hanna-Barbera. I remember Mork and Mindy show was one I wrote. And yeah, Mork and Mindy, Laverne and yeah. Shirley Bonds Hour. Yeah, i got to explain. They came up with the idea of doing an animated versions of Mork and Mindy, Laverne and Shirley, and Happy Days. Mm -hmm. At first blush, you go, well, okay, it could work. You could do bigger, broader physical comedy type things. You could do like Wacky Races or something like that. But they went completely nuts. Laverne and Shirley went into the Army, and they had a pig as their drill sergeant. Oh, my goodness. Uh, I forget what they did with uh, Happy Days. I do know that uh, Henry Winkler, if I remember correctly, Henry Winkler just absolutely refused to have anything to do with the show. So it was like the supporting cast of Happy Days. I think the Fonz showed up every now and then just to, like, snap his fingers and lift his thumb, and that was it. But the Mork wow. and Mindy one was Mork and Mindy as teenagers, which you go, well, they don't meet each other until they're young adults. But, well, we want to do them as teenagers. Okay, fine. They had Robin Williams over a barrel because he was contractually obliged to do the show. I wrote a script for them. I did an RR joke in it. I made a, you know, an RRR type thing that he used mm -hmm. to do all the time. And the story editor, who shall go nameless except to say it was Norman Maurer, <laughs> <laughs> he said he changed it to onk, onk, onk. And I said, no, 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 it, it's not onk, onk, onk. It's RRR. It's very clearly an R sound because they make R puns off of it. You know, how would you like a little R and R? R, 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 you know? I said, it's, it's uh -huh. clearly an R sound. No, it's onk. And he would not budge on this. He was determined to prove he was right. Well, they sent the script to Robin Williams. And Williams knows what it is that he says because he's the one who originates it and does it. Williams looked at the script, told Joe Ruby, okay, here's what I'm doing. You're going to write all the scripts for this show and send them to me. And I'm going to record them in my house, one take, and send you the tape. And that's it. Nothing else. He literally recorded all the episodes flat on his back in his bedroom, reading them into a cassette recorder. And that was it. Did the absolute bare minimum to meet the contractual obligations. Try as hard as we could. We couldn't make it funny because if you, if you have someone who is so unfamiliar with the show that they don't even know the catchphrases to it. You're not going to capture the characters. And it was what it was, and it, all you can say was cocaine was a hell of a problem in the 1980s. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh Let's see. Puppies Further Adventures. I did um. one episode of that. The, the puppy was one of the first hits that Ruby Spears had. And when they were doing the puppies as specials, I think they would do like one or two a year. It was a very successful series for them because they put time and effort into it. They do it really well. They were sweet animal stories. And then they sold it as a series. And when they sold it as a series, they could no longer spend the time and effort and they had to just crank it out. It 
is not a bad show. I'm mm -hmm. proud of my work on it. It's the kind of show you can point to and say, they should do more shows that are not toy oriented like this. More shows mm -hmm. that are not slam bang action adventure, but are more character oriented like this. But mm -hmm. there just wasn't the time to do it properly the way they had with the original specials. It's a good show. It's not a great show. Following that, Saturday Supercade. This sounds like an umbrella title that may have had a bunch of segments. Yeah, this is when we first hear Mario speak, voiced by Peter Cullen. Okay, actually. Joe got the rights to a batch of video games. And one of the ones he got the rights to was Qbert. He asked Gary Greenfield and me to, to, to develop Qbert. Now, if there's anybody listening who isn't familiar with Qbert, Qbert was a multidimensional game where your orientation changed constantly. The boxes stacked in a triangular fashion optical illusion, which depending mm -hmm. upon which way you look at it, up and down can be one way or another. Yeah. In the game, Qbert is trying to avoid these snakes that are trying to get him. And the way Qbert can avoid the snakes is by changing his orientation. So if he was upright at one moment, he can be upright in a different direction the next moment. I remember the Gary, cartoon yeah. too. Yeah. yeah. Gary and I looked at that and we said, well, son of a gun, this is basically the Roadrunner in four dimensions. And yeah. we thought this could be a cute cartoon if, if you add a fourth dimension to a Roadrunner story. And you and so we sat down and we came up with every changing the orientation type gag we could come up with. And we spent a lot of time and effort on it. We ended up with, I think, something like 30 some gags that we had as examples that we could then hand to the storyboard artists who could then build off of it and whatnot. We showed it could be done. That was the important thing. Yeah. And so we did this presentation where, as I said, Qbert is the roadrunner. The, the, the snakes are the, uh, the coyotes. It's the yeah. roadrunner in 4D. We had this all worked out. Gary and I go in to see Joe to deliver it. I am not exaggerating. What literally happened was we handed him the presentation. He took it and in one motion threw it unread in the trash can and said, I want you to do Qbert as happy days. At that point, we both go, eh, not us. That is not, no, we wow. cannot shift gears. Oh, so I ended up working on the show on some segments, and I can't tell you now which ones they were. I don't know if I was doing whole scripts or if they just come in and, you know, toss a script on my desk and say, fix this or plus it out, try to add stuff to it. It wow. didn't, no, nothing about that show other than the Qbert experience sticks with me. And I can understand why. I mean, mm. that's that would be frustrating for anybody. Yeah. Also listed an episode for the Dungeons and Dragons cartoon. Right, Deckion, which is another the, one that I watched. The Skeletal yeah. Warrior, they, yeah. Yes, Quest of the Skeleton Warrior. I knew Flint Billy, who at the time had a close working relationship with Gary Gygax. Mm -hmm. uh, Flint would take me up to Gygax's. If you can imagine the Playboy Mansion for D and D, okay, that's what it was like. <laughs> I mean, really, it, it, you know, there, there the, weren't the, any scantily the father clad. Of role yeah, there weren't games. any. I mean, go on. Clad, yeah, there weren't any scantily clad ladies around, but man, there was every D and D possible thing you could want up there. Go up there and hang <laughs> no. out with them, and and so I understood what D and D was, and I understood the different yeah. characters and whatnot. The nice thing about the show was that they wanted to do something a little more than the standard Saturday morning. Oh, he's he's snag the whatchamacallit of the whim wham we've got to get it back yes we we were trying to do something a little bit different i pitched the idea for quest of the skeleton warrior because i wanted to do an antagonist who was not irredeemably evil he was wrong he was doing bad things but when you understood why you'd go well yeah i can understand that i can I may not agree with it, but I can understand why he would do that sort of thing. I also wanted to introduce that our characters have their own personal fears and shortcomings, things that they are anxieties within them. Right. So basically analyze the characters and you just say, well, whatever strength they project 
it is to compensate for a fear in the opposite angle. Mm -hmm. And so I worked all that in and I was very happy with that. I was, that was up to that point, the best script that I had ever written, I felt. Turned out to be a popular show. I still get people asking me about it and remembering it to this day. And one of the shows that I'm very proud to have on my resume, because I think mm -hmm. it was head and shoulders above anything else that was being tried at the time. I think we pulled it off. It's like five different yeah. stories on Alvin and the Chipmunks, too. Oh, yeah. Oh, that, was, oh. that was a fun series, because Alvin and the Chipmunks, they had been a novelty recording act way back in the 50s, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. original Ross Bagdasarian. Mm -hmm. He came up with the Witch Doctor song. Other people had done sped up music songs before, especially novelty songs and whatnot. But Ross had the insight that made it work. And what Ross's insight was this, is you record the music. If you're recording the chipmunks, the people singing the chipmunks at 45 or at 33 to play back at 45 to speed them up, then the music has to be recorded slower so that when it's sped up, the music sounds normal and the chipmunks are singing in tune with the music. Because other people who had done that sort of thing, it just, it, it just sounded weird because the music was all sped up as well. Right. And, and so he had the, the music recorded slowly, people singing in the chipmunk voices normally. And then when it's sped up, the music sounds normal, but the chipmunks sound like the chipmunks. Also had interesting characters, Simon, Theodore, and Alvin. They did a, a TV series in the 1960s that was pretty funny. When they revived it, again, I got tapped for it because it was guy. oh yeah, I know that. I understand those characters. And I was mm -hmm. able to demonstrate pretty quickly that yes, indeed, I knew who they were. I knew how they interacted with each other. And you say five, that's, that sounds mm -hmm. about right. I, I can't tell you for the life of me. I know one was about Alvin directing a movie. The segments listed are Match Play, Don't Be a Vidiot, A Dog's Best Friend is His Chipmunk, The Chip Punks, and Mr. Fabulous. Yeah, I think it was probably Don't Be a Vidiot was the, the one where he was directing. But they were, they were fun to do. I don't think... I can't remember if I wrote it or if I was simply around when Jack Anyart suggested it. For some reason, Jack Anyart is associated with it in my mind somehow, and I, I can't mm -hmm. exactly recall. They needed to write original songs because it was too expensive to get existing songs unless the existing songs were public domain. Right. Three Little Maids from School from the Mikado turned out to be public domain. He had a, the chipmunks in drag doing three little girls from school. It actually worked kind of well. You look at it and goes, well, that's really strange, but hey, it works. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can't remember if I did that or if Jack did that or if we might have even worked on it together. I don't know. Yeah. And you also did a couple episodes of Mr. T. I which did was one right episode, on the... episode of Mr. T. And I've actually made more money off that one episode of Mr. T because there was a live action bumper to it. And that mm -hmm. was covered by the Writers Guild. And that meant you got residuals when it went into reruns. And I mm -hmm. saw more money off the three minute bumper front and back that I did for Mr. T than I did off of almost any other thing I ever wrote. And Mr. T was, of course, on the heels of... A-Team. The A-Team, yeah. Yeah. That he did. That was another show that, and it, it's good to bring this up to set the stage for G.I. Joe and Transformers. Mm -hmm. We had 17 characters in that show. The network insisted every character have at least one line of dialogue per episode. By the time you got through of every character saying one line of dialogue, the show's practically over. Again, it didn't make a lot of sense. He's Mr. T is the coach slash bus driver of a gymnastics team. They go around solving mysteries. There's yeah, a dog and I involved. Just, yeah, there's, yeah. yeah, I remember distinctly one of the episodes, one of the gymnasts, one of the girls, she had a photographic memory. Her memory started failing her and she was slowing down and she was getting tired all the time. And come to find out, she couldn't even remember the last time she ate. She's becoming anorexic. 
-hmm. So that was one of the issues that they had dealt with was uh, anorexia and mm -hmm. trying to starve yourself to be thinner is not good. And, you know, there are better ways to do that. And that was one of the episodes that I distinctly remember from that series. And they cover a lot of different things like that. I will, I will give them credit for doing something like that. I just remembered the shows were so cumbersome to write because yeah. you needed to have, in addition to Mr. T and the other 16 or 17 characters, you had to have one, at least one bad guy, and you had to have at least one victim who would say to Mr. T, oh, something mysterious has happened and I can't figure out what it is. And Mr. T would say, well, we'll go solve that problem. Then it ends up wow. with the basic plot with Scooby-Doo, only there was no Scooby-Doo involved. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. no. I remember coming up with an idea because I was trying to, I was planning to sneak something in if I could get away with it, see if I could pull it off. And I had pitched a story idea about a family where the women in the family were being kidnapped. And the reason they were being kidnapped was that the villain knew one of them. He knew that a female in the family had inherited the secret information to where the mine was or the treasure was or something like that. He didn't know which woman in the family. And so he was kidnapping every female in the family to try to find out which one had the information. The name of the family was going to be the White family because I wanted to have uh, a scene where Mr. T kicks in a door and demands, where are you keeping the white women at? <laughs> never got, <laughs> never got uh, to script stage on that. But... <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been hysterical, actually. <laughs> Mr. T is actually a cool guy. I mean, he's he's um, yeah. you know he's a real interesting guy, and he, his on-screen persona is not who he is. And yeah. this was back; people did not yet recognize that. In fact, unfortunately, today a lot of people don't recognize it. They yeah. see these quote reality show stars unquote, and they assume that's who that person is in reality. It's oh, no, cool. that is the persona they put on in front of the TV in order to sell you toilet paper. They, yeah. they are acting. They are yeah, not. The whole, exactly. his whole, uh, pity the fool, you know, everybody yeah, exactly. knows that. It's a classic line, and that's yeah. not mm -hmm. how he is in real life. Isn't he a minister now? Yeah, he was a minister at one point. Following Mr. T, there was the Mighty Orbits, and then mm -hmm. G.I. Joe Arise, Serpentor Arise, TV movie. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that. And then three episodes of the Transformers, The God Gambit, Prime Target, and Carnage in C Minor. Mm -hmm. uh, those are the episodes that I have my name on as a writing credit. I was a staff writer at Sunbow, then mm -hmm. a story editor. If you were a creative producer or a story editor, you, you were just expected to fix other people's scripts. We had, <laughs> no, well, let me explain the situation. We had at one point 180 episodes of at least one, two, three, five different series that had to be written and delivered on an almost daily basis. So we had to deliver a script a day to the animation studio. You, That's you, a huge turnover. It is a huge turnover. When I was working at Sunbow, you know, I'd go to the office, I'd work at the office, I'd come home, I would work at home, and at two o'clock in the morning, if I was stuck on a script, I could pick up the phone and call anybody else who worked at the office, and they'd be up and working on their scripts because it was just that huge a demand that was going on. I would get scripts... It could be anything from a light polish to a page one rewrite. My philosophy was always a story editor to fix scripts that other people have done. I am not a story editor to slap my name on other people's work. There are three scripts that I am credited with. There are more than three scripts that I worked on. But again, I couldn't tell you right now off the top mm -hmm. of my head what they were. Carnage and C Minor, the third season episode. Mm -hmm. Me, personally, I thought it was a fun episode because the characters sang instead of yeah. spoke. And yeah. my favorite line from my favorite character comes out of that episode, Soundwave. 
Galvatron says, what was that? Because the sound that they used to destroy the asteroid. Now, And he goes, that was heaven, the purest, most vibrant, most perfect sound I've ever heard. And it's the most emotion you ever hear out of Soundwave. And I love mm-hmm. that line because it epitomizes who he is as an audiophile in yeah. general. And I, it's, it's my favorite line from my favorite character, and it's in that episode, and I love it. <laughs> the origin of that goes all the way back to Filmation, believe it or not. When I was at Filmation during the hiatus period, they said, just come up with show ideas. And mm-hmm. so we, we would just sit there and we would write up anywhere from one to four page story ideas. And mm-hmm. I came up with an idea about superheroes who use guitars and music to do their superhero deeds with. Went nowhere, but I remember having the idea at Filmation. And then when we got to Transformers, we're doing shows. It's like, oh, geez, we need 25 more episodes. What, what, what ideas have you got for Transformers? Well, what about this? Done it. What about this? Done it. What about this? Done it. What about using music as a weapon? Haven't done that one. Go. (laughs) (laughs) And it it worked so well, too, Mm -hmm. in in that episode. I actually really enjoyed that episode. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that. (laughs) That That's really cool. I'm glad you liked it. Then you did the Inhumanoids. Yeah. Episode of the Inhumanoids. At that point, you also did several, looks like 11 episodes, according to this, for G.I. Joe. Yeah. I worked on every West Coast Sunbow show there was. I believe there was one show that was done by a company on the East Coast. It was done through the East Coast Sunbow office, Air Defenders or something like that. I'm not 100% sure. But if it was done on the West Coast, I wrote it. At least one episode. Yeah, Bionic Um, 6. I I don't think Bionic 6 was Sunbow. I think that was TMS. Mm. But anyway, I did My Little Pony, I did Gem, I did Visionaries and Humanoids, Transformers, and G.I. Joe. Mm -hmm. In Humanoids and Gem were interesting from this perspective. Both toys were canceled, but the shows continued on. In the case of Gem, the toy was canceled at the first you know, by the end of the first season. And frankly, it was an ugly fashion doll. What can I say? But (laughs) the show was so popular Mm -hmm. that Hasbro and Sunbow realized we can just keep doing the episodes because the the kids won't buy the toys, but they'll watch the show and we can advertise other shows' products on Gem. They kept it going for another year simply because there was enough of a fan base, enough people wanted to see that series to keep it going. Mm Even without a toy. In Humanoids, it was the opposite problem. Hasbro later admitted that they had made a mistake by making the Inhumanoid toys more expensive than the G.I. Joe toys and the Transformer toys. Mm -hmm. As a result, kids couldn't buy them with their own money. They had to have mom or dad cough up 20 bucks to buy something. In those days, 20 bucks was was a a a hunk of change parent could go in and they could look at a transformer and go, okay, 20 bucks. I don't understand this, but it looks okay. Or they would look at a GI Joe vehicle and go, okay, the GI Joes ride this. I understand what they're doing with it. Fine. 20 bucks. They would look at some of this stuff for transformers. And it's like, my God, what is this? And uh, Mm -hmm. no, you're not having that. The toy line, even though the show was popular and even though when the kids could acquire the toys, they liked them. The parents were just saying no, and they were refusing to buy the toys. And if the toys had had a $3, $4 version that kids could buy with their own allowances and whatnot, it would have probably been a successful line. But because everything was in the $20 yeah. up range, it died. But the interesting that thing was, was – in humanoids. Yes, in humanoids. The interesting thing was in humanoids died halfway through the first season. They just pulled the plug mm. on in humanoids and said, we're not doing it anymore. We're killing the toy line. But we've committed to doing this show. So basically, as mm. long as it's not X-rated, do whatever you want. <laughs> and it's like, okay. <laughs> and we just, yeah. wow. we just pulled the plugs out. I mean, we, we just went completely nuts. Yeah. And 
balls to the wall in your face horror. Exactly. In a way. Yeah. You know. So okay. All yeah. right. Fine. I mean, we. I did an episode where we have all these teenagers turning into zombies, going kill, kill, kill. The voice <laughs> artist went, "Whoa! Wait a minute. Wait, wait. What are we doing here?" You know. <laughs> And I said, no, 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 trust us. They get better by the end of the episode. Yeah, yeah, right. And one of the characters ran for president and got elected. I mean, we just went completely crazy with the show at the end of it. And it, it was fun. It is memorable and people like it still. Mm -hmm. We had the supreme liberty of just not giving a rip. We didn't yeah. have to sell any toys. We didn't have to worry about the show being renewed because we knew it wasn't going to be renewed. We had mm -hmm. six or eight episodes that had to be filled as long as there was no blood and as long as there was no TNA, do whatever you like. Yeah. That's liberating for a writer, I would imagine. Well, except for one villain just, like, get killed. Yeah, but the villain that got killed was a monster, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He was he was a scientist, and then he got resurrected as an undead zombie, but he was, like, on, got into a toxic waste, and they burned his flesh off, nothing but skin and bone. The argument would have probably been made, well, he's already dead. I mean, he's just reanimated. Oh, okay, yeah. all right. We're not yeah. killing somebody. We're just desecrating a corpse. Come on. Exactly. <laughs> That's just as bad. <laughs> That's just as bad. Yep. Get away with half that stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Then you did Bionic 6, Visionaries, mm -hmm. Knights of the Magical Light, a couple episodes of Superman. Yep. Brave Star, The Ballad of yeah. Sarah Jane. I did one episode of Brave Star. That was a filmation production. I have never seen any episode of Brave Star except the one episode that I wrote, even though they gave me a complete set as a thank you. The reason I'll never watch any episode other than the one I wrote is that the one I wrote is animated rather well. I like it. And I know if I watch any other episodes, I will see that about 85% of my episode was same as animation from other episodes. So mm -hmm. as long as I don't know other episodes using the same as animation, I'm looking at it and going, hey, they did a nice job. And I'll just mm -hmm. leave it at that. Yeah. 3030 had a very strange relationship with his gun. That's all I got to say on that one. Even it was, though he was yeah. my favorite character, but it's like, he had a Arthur, very strange relationship with his rifle. <laughs> Arthur Nadell was the, the producer on that, uh, the mm. creative producer. He was very conflicted over the weapons aspect of it because mm -hmm. you do cowboy shows, even space cowboys, you've got to have a weapons, a weapon of some yeah. kind. But he was very uncomfortable about promoting weapons, even toy weapons. Yeah. At the time Brave Star came out, there were two other shows. There was, I think, Star Saber and there was Galaxy Rangers. So it means like three, simultaneously, three space cowboy shows at the same mm -hmm. time. And they basically just stepped on each other. I mean, each the ideas were visually too similar. None of them broke out and became memorable. And I'm not saying they weren't well done. I'm just saying they, they couldn't separate themselves from the others. They couldn't separate themselves from the herd. It was not like when Transformers was announced, they rushed GoBots into production. Even though GoBots beat Transformer on the air, Transformers, the quality pulled it up above GoBots. And then mm -hmm. when you had later shows like, oh, what was it? Not Macross. Yeah. Shows Macross, like yeah. Macross, they were different enough from Transformers that they stood out on their own. Right. But those three Space Cowboy shows, they were just literally, you. it was almost impossible to tell them apart by looking at them they didn't necessarily get the success that they might have had if only one of them had been on the air at that time. Yeah. The thing with, with Brave Star, at least for me, that stood out from any other Wild West cowboy show, whatever, is the fact that the main character was an American Indian, mm -hmm. and his companion was a horse that shapeshifted. Mm -hmm. And being part Cheyenne myself and growing up mm -hmm. with that, that stood out to me. That the main character is this Native American guy. 
and he uses totem powers to do what he needs to do. And I think that, at least for me, that made it stand out above, you know, other westerns and and cartoons and tw- and whatnot. And you have why to, I liked the show. You have to give both Lou Scheimer and Arthur Nadell credit for being more foresighted and more progressive than other Mm -hmm. producers and networks at the time. And it's Mm -hmm. not that the other producers and networks consciously did this. It's Mm -hmm. just, if they had to do a show, they just automatically cast it with all white characters and Lou would make an effort. Well, can we have one character who is African American or Chinese or something I mean, I mentioned Super Stretch and, and Micro Woman earlier. They were African American. They were like the first regularly scheduled African American superheroes on television at the time. Yeah. And unfortunately, they just got sued by Marvel and DC. But mm-hmm. there was at least an attempt there to have some mm-hmm. diversity. Yeah. I thought that was an interesting thing about it. I tried to keep that in mind when I was writing the character, not mm-hmm. write generic, but write something that was was reflective of someone from that background. Mm-hmm. Arthur, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you an interesting story about Arthur. Early in his career, he was directing episodes of The Rifleman, Chuck Connors. He and Chuck Connors were real good friends. But he was directing episodes of The Rifleman, and he would alternate with another director. So Arthur mm-hmm. would do a story one week, and the other director would do the story the next week, and then Arthur would do the story the third week. And while they would be handed the scripts, because the story editor and the producer would come up with the scripts, while they were being handed the scripts, both the producer and the story editor knew, well, Arthur is stronger with this kind of story, and the other guy is stronger with that kind of story. Mm-hmm. So when you were watching The Rifleman, it was kind of a schizophrenic series because in one episode rifleman's son would come up and say dad there's a problem at school my my best friend is cheating and i don't i don't want to get him in trouble but cheating isn't right well son you know you got to do what's right and you got to and so they do this sweet heartfelt g-rated family story disney-esque type thing Mm-hmm. And then the next week, the Wild Bunch comes into town and uh, Lucas guns down 50 people. The other director that he was alternating with, Sam Peckinpah. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> so they're doing shows, you're doing basically a G-rated Disney show one week, and then Peckinpah's practicing for the Wild Bunch. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, that would make for a very schizophrenic show. <laughs> My goodness. <laughs> and that's what happens when you've got too many cooks in the co- in the kitchen. Mm-hmm. You yeah. end up with, with something like that. It's like, eh, it doesn't work. <laughs> Somebody <laughs> body count super cut of the rifleman. And, and I think it's like 500 people. In the course oh, of the goodness. series, he kills 500 people. That's like, oh, my goodness. goodness. This, was, this was like wholesome television when we were growing up. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> that's crazy. Oh, yeah. That is absolutely crazy. Uh, you mentioned Jim. Mm-hmm. A couple episodes of that. Garbage Pail Kids. That never got on the air, though I understand it was eventually released to DVD. Mm-hmm. And it didn't get on the air because you know what the Garbage Pail Kids were? They were a parody of the Cabbage Patch Kids. Mm-hmm. And they were just gross-out parodies. Yeah, I remember um, the, the stickers. Ugh. And we just basically did a, a slapstick comedy show based on those characters. I think mine was called Kinky Kong, and it referred mm-hmm. to his hair being kinky. He was having trouble keeping his hair straight or something. Parents, and this kind of harkens back to the Inhumanoids thing. You know, mm-hmm. any kid with 25 cents could buy a pack of Garbage Pail Kid cards, trade them and collect them and whatnot. Yeah, And the parents had no knowledge or control over what the kids were buying. Yeah. By the time it gets on the air, they know what the Garbage Pail Kids are. And there was like an outcry by various parents groups. No, we do not want this on the air. We do not want our kids seeing this. And so the <laughs> network caved. And even though the show was completed and in the can, I think like two weeks before it was set to premiere, they said, nope, we're not going to air it. And, and they canceled it. Wow. Explain something. And 
explain why we loved doing G.I. Joe and Transformers so much. Mm. In the late 60s, they had been doing a show on TV called Hot Wheels, based on the toy line. Right. And it was a generic car-oriented show, but it was selling the Hot Wheel toys. Somebody protested this, saying, well, basically what this is is a half-hour toy commercial. Ignoring the fact that one of the best TV shows ever was an hour-long car commercial, Route 66, ignoring that, the FCC said, yeah, you're right, we, you shouldn't have a half-hour commercial for kids or toys. And so they killed Hot Wheels, and they killed a couple of shows. I think Linus the Lionhearted was already off the air at that point, but there were other people developing shows based on serial characters, and they were told, no, you can't do that either. So, in essence, just barred any show based on a toy. Mm -hmm. But there was a loophole, and the loophole was if you had a pre-existing literary property that then became a toy, you could do a cartoon show based not on the toy, but on the pre-existing literary property. The character. Okay? Exactly. So hold that thought in your head for a moment. Okay. Mm -hmm. At the same time, they start cutting back on the violence in the shows. Now, I've already mentioned with Filmation, one season they let him throw the same rotoscope bad guy that the next season he couldn't do the judo throw because uh, to the Roman centurion because the standards of violence had changed. And right. we had ridiculous restrictions on us. You couldn't punch anybody. You couldn't shoot anybody. You couldn't shoot yeah. at anybody. Filmation did The Lone Ranger. I didn't work on that show. But The Lone mm -hmm. Ranger, at first, they didn't want him to carry a gun. But then they said, well, you know, he's got to carry a gun because otherwise, how do you explain the silver bullets? And so he could carry a gun, but he could never fire it unless he was doing something like shooting a boulder to cause it to roll down and block path of a bad guy who was trying to catch him or something. Mm -hmm. So he could never use the weapon okay. as a gun okay. against anyone. And there were all of these restrictions. When we were, we were doing a pilot for a show that never got done called Roxy's Raiders, which was, was basically a teenage Indiana Jones who owned her own circus and the sideshow characters would help her solve crimes, which, and Jack Kirby did the art on this. So you're going, well, for heaven's sakes, this could be one of the craziest things ever done. Let's do this. And it was like, no, right. it's too crazy for us. But anyway, <laughs> we were doing a show in the pilot episode. Roxy is tied to a stake in a chamber that is flooding with water. And the bad guy releases two eels that comes swimming out to attack her. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a fairly standard serial peril there. I mean, that's not outrageously, in terms of the old serials, that's not outrageous. Right. Mm -hmm. And it avoided the network restriction against imitatable violence. Punching somebody, that's imitatable. Hitting them with a bat, stabbing them, that's imitatable. Building a giant robot and sending the giant robot after him, that's not imitatable. So they would restrict you to things that kids could not do easily. So we're thinking, well, you know, most kids do not have access to giant moray eels. This shouldn't be a problem. And the network came back and said, you have to put a rock between Goldie and the eels. Because if the bad guy releases the eels and the eels can see Goldie, then he's deliberately trying to hurt Goldie. But if he releases the eels and the eels have to swim around the rock and then see Goldie, he's not deliberately hurting her. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that was pretty much our reaction, too. All right. <laughs> Saturday morning television was pretty hard to write for. You had to be very circumspect in what you were doing. Hanna-Barbera saw these toys, these tchotchkes that were going around, the Smurfs. There were key rings, there were little dolls, were all this stuff. They were looking at it and going, geez, you know, we'd really love to make a show based on that, but you can't base a show on a toy. And then somebody said, but they're based on a Belgian comic book. Oh, really? So they do the Smurf show, and the FCC says, you can't do it, it's based on a show, on a toy. And they said, oh, no. And they whip out the comic book and say, see? It's never been printed in the United States, but it was printed in Belgium. We can, mm -hmm. we can do this. And they go, well, yeah, you're right. Okay. Well, that released the floodgates.
because the next thing mm-hmm. that happened was that Rainbow Bright, no, Strawberry Shortcake yeah. comes along. Because Strawberry Shortcake had been a character in greeting cards. The Hallmark people said, well, greeting cards are a form of literature. Yeah, okay, fine. Mm-hmm. And then Strawberry Shortcake's on the air. Mattel took He-Man, the He-Man characters, went to DC and said, we need you to do a comic book based on this. We'll pay you to do a comic book. Minimum of three issues. We, we basically don't care what you do with it because we're going to ignore it. But we just need the names and the likenesses in a comic book. We do this three-issue miniseries. It's awful. I mean, it, it was awful as a standalone, and it's awful in the context of what ended up becoming yeah. He-Man. But it mm-hmm. established the look and the names of the characters. So when they did the He-Man series at Filmation, they could hold up the comic book as a fig leaf. Yeah, Hasbro right. bro did the same thing with Marvel. They said, mm-hmm, you know, publish, publish some comic books for us yeah. for Transformers and for G.I. Joe. We'll then base a TV series on them. And that's exactly yeah. what happened. Yeah, Because the comic yeah. books for Transformers, the first one came out May 8th. And yeah. the Transformers series, yeah. the first episode aired September 17th, same year, yep. 1984. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Whatever it was. So by the time everybody had caught on to the scam and everybody was finding somebody to do a cough comic book real quick, and at that point the FCC just basically said, you know, screw it, you'll you'll find a way around the ruling anyway, so just go ahead and you can base them on toys. And at that yeah. point it opened the floodgates and everybody came out with various toys and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Including Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and, exactly. and a bunch of others. Yeah. Yeah. But – the network restrictions against violence and against language and mm-hmm. sexual innuendo and stuff like that, everybody had felt hemmed in by that on the networks. And when mm-hmm. the syndicated shows came along, the deal was they would offer the show virtually for free to a local station. They'd mm-hmm. say, we'll give you a half hour show, but and you, you can sell advertising you can sell half the advertising time locally. We have the advertising time for our products on the rest of the, the, the other half of the advertising. So a 22-minute show would have roughly five to six minutes of advertising in it. Three mm-hmm. minutes to the local station, three minutes to Hasbro, and everybody's happy. The local stations are going, well, son of a gun, we're getting brand new shows every day, good quality animation, good stories Mm -hmm. for free, and then we get to charge people to run commercials on them? Sure, absolutely. As a result, the syndication market became a toy-oriented market and took over. But Mm -hmm. because of that, there were no restrictions on what we could well, let me take that back. There were far fewer restrictions on yeah. what we could say and do than on the networks. So when we started doing G.I. Joe, very typically the first script everybody did for G.I. Joe was a complete balls to the wall, fist fights, explosions, shoot people, crash into mm-hmm. things, just go mm-hmm. completely yeah. nuts. And then you'd get it out of your system and you'd go, do I have to do this for the next episode as well? Can we do something different? That's what made G.I. Joe work was because everybody, their first episode was just that crazy, get it all out of your system at one time episode. Hold Down the Heavens. That was the first one I did. And it was just like, man, everything I've been wanting to do for the last 10 years is coming Mm -hmm. out now. And when it was done, it was like, well, I don't have to do that again. I'm I'm purred. I can find something else to do with these characters. And we ended up doing really interesting stories and episodes based on it. Because at that point, we stopped just making spectacle and we started doing shows about the characters. Mm -hmm. And because we had so many characters, we couldn't do what was hampering with Mr. T. Mr. T, as I said, you have 17 characters. Each one has to have a line of dialogue. G.I. Joe, Mm -hmm. you'd have, uh, I think at the high watermark, we had 84 characters that we could draw from, Joes and Cobras. Cobra. And at that point, it was like, well, come up with a story that you'd like to do and then find the Joe that would fit that story and just do the story about him and two or three other Joes. The rest of them, you can put them all in the background. You let the storyboard artists animate them in and whatnot. 
I mean, more than mm-hmm. once we would do a show where you know, there would be like a pan across the mess hall or something like that, just to show as many characters as we could in the background. But they didn't have to talk. They didn't have to do anything. They were just there. Yeah. And as a result, we were able to do stories that focused on characters and the interplay of the characters. It ended up being a pretty good series, if I say so myself. I think a lot of the episodes still stand up to this day. Yeah. Yeah, they do. G.I. Joe was one of the ones, along with He-Man and She-Ra and Brave Star, were one of the ones that had the PSAs at the end. Yeah. yeah. It was one of several I, during that time frame I forget. that did that. Yeah, I forget who originated that, but somebody somewhere correctly thought if we have a PSA at the end of it, then uh, you know they can't accuse us of being entirely mercenary because we can say, no, look, we gave up 30 seconds of commercial time to tell kids not to stick a fork in an electric socket. So, mm-hmm. Right. And the show, PSA, always related back to the episode and what was going on in the episode. Like, exactly. you know, don't do drugs, don't... That kind of thing. It was actually really successful. Mr. T also had PSAs. They were the live action, and they did that because they were also trying to soften Mr. T's image. If Mr. T was just talking tough, then it's one thing. If Mr. T ends up by saying, don't steal stuff because you'll go to jail, that makes him a more, quote, likable character, unquote, according to the networks. Networks were obsessed with the characters being likable. And with G.I. Joe, we could have Joes who were pretty unlikable characters. I mean, one of the most popular characters we had was Lowlight. And I mean, the guy's a sniper. He's just a sociopath. There are kids out there who like sociopaths, so fine. Could find some stories mm-hmm. for him to do and put him in, and he worked just fine. Yeah, yeah. Let's see. Chippendale Rescue Rangers. I remember mm-hmm. that show. I did one episode of that. Mm-hmm. Um, Flash the Wonder Flash the Wonder Dog, yeah. I mean, that's how that (laughs) came about. I was trying to think of what to do, and I remembered the movie 101 Dalmatians, the Dalmatian pups loving Mm -hmm. the Rin Tin Tin type character. I'm a fan of opera, and I remembered Wagner's The Flying Dutchman. Mm -hmm. And I imagined, well, what would that sound like if a dog howled? And the moment that popped into my head, well, there's the story. That's how it all fits together. And uh, Mm -hmm. that was the Chippendale that I wrote. Very cute. Very, very cute. These times, a lot of times you write stories. I mean, people say, where do you get your ideas? And uh, the best answer, the best non-snarky answer that I've ever heard somebody say is that the ideas are all around you. You encounter a thousand ideas a day. The difference between the average person and a writer is that the writer notices 10 of those ideas, and the average person doesn't notice any of them. But you'll be reading something or doing something, and you'll a word, a phrase pops up, an image, and you go, hmm, now what would happen if you start playing with it? And so many Transformer and G.I. Joe episodes started with, well, what would happen if the mm-hmm. traitor my thought was we have never seen the home life of any of these Joes. They're they're always on duty when we see them. Mm -hmm. The rationale between them having these kind of crazy nicknames and whatnot is that those are nom de guerre. They are names they go by, code names they go by, so that Cobra won't figure out who their families are and strike back at their families. And I thought, well, what would happen if Cobra did figure that out? What What would happen if Cobra was able to put two and two together and realize we have a leverage point on this guy. And that's what the trader was all about. It was a story of Dusty Rudat. His mother is sick. She needs medical attention. He's desperate to provide it for her. And Cobra finds this out and they go, oh, there's the lever. He needs money. And we can make it real easy for him to get the money. That leads into the rest of the show and it resonated with our young audiences because they could relate to being anxious about their parents being sick that's something that wow that that touches home to them yeah and now they're facing well what would i do would i be brave and say no i'm not going to help you or go well maybe if if nobody's going to get hurt i could take the money and help my mom and that's what made Mm -hmm. the show work 
you couldn't get away with that on the networks. The networks, for the most part, didn't want that sort of thing. They wanted all the crimes to be crimes where... My criticism was, if the Joker steals the Eiffel Tower, is Batman going to miss a meal? No. I mean, it doesn't matter to Batman if, if the Joker is stolen the Eiffel Tower. Right. Why, why would the Batman get involved other than he's just got a lifelong enmity against the Joker? When we were doing G.I. Joe, when we were doing Transformers, we relied on the fact that we had so many different characters, we could find some personal reason for one of those Joes to have a stake in that particular episode. And as a result, the shows resonated, I think. That, I think that was one of the things that gave them the best strength that they had. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's one of the reasons why it has, as long as mm -hmm. it has. I mean, you've got Transformers has been around since 84, so you're talking 32 years at this point. Mm -hmm. G.I. Joe, same thing. Mm -hmm. I think it came out about the same year or the year after. So, yeah, and it's because of the way they've been written and the way the characters have been portrayed and detailed in that way mm -hmm. that the kids fall in love with these characters. And that's why... It's been so successful over these yeah. years, which is a huge testament to writers like you. Well, thank you. I have told this to people before, and I'll repeat it again. When I was growing up, when I was a child and a young teenager, my family moved a lot. Mm -hmm. I mean, like every year we were in a different home. Even if we were in the same town, we were in a different home. And I changed schools a lot because of that. And so I didn't have any long-term friends when I was growing up. And I got into science fiction fandom for no small reason that my circle of friends was never any further away than my mailbox. If you're reading the fanzines, if you're participating in fandom and whatnot, all you have to do is give them a change of address and they'll find you. They'll be waiting for me, literally. We moved to a new house and there'd be a bunch of letters and magazines waiting for me. And I, my friends were there. In reading science fiction fandom and reading the history of science fiction and, and, and the different creators and whatnot, I was always struck by the EC bullpen of the uh, early 50s. Wally Wood, Gasly Ingalls, Harvey Kurtzman, all of those guys. They did Tales from the Crypt, they did Vault mm. of Horror, they did the various science fiction and action yeah. titles. And it was just a wonderful environment, a wonderful creative environment where they were in the right kind of competition with one another. Yeah. I just did this in a story. Wow, that's cool. What can I do that will be as good or, or better? And then the right. competition was not, I'm going to be a higher status than you, but... I'm going to do something even better than that. It became a good competition. It became the kind of thing that crafted really extraordinary art and stories. I remember thinking when I was still in my teens, I hope someday I get to be involved in something that is, is a great work environment where I'll be able to hang out with a lot of really great, wonderful, creative people. And we'll get to do really exciting, fun stuff that people will remember for a long time. Challenging each other to do better yeah. and better and better. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and that's when you get really, when you get creative people who are willing to not only put aside their own egos, but ch actually challenge each other. Hey, let's see if you can yeah. do better. Be hung up on me, 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 me. That's mm -hmm. when you get your best stories, your best characters, best work yeah. coming out. I'll give an example here, going back to Mr. T, that shows the, the wrong kind of attitude as opposed to the right kind of attitude. There mm -hmm. was one writer at Ruby Spears at that time who had one or two live action credits. Mm -hmm. And he tried to convince Joe Ruby, he says, well, since I'm the only real live action writer here, I should write all the live action wraparounds for the show because I know how to write live action. Joe was on the verge of saying, yeah, go ahead and write it. The rest of us went, no, 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 no. That's where the money's going to be. That's where the residuals are going to be. We're not going to hand over the residuals for this show to this guy. We had a little rebellion. We just went in and flat out said, if he writes the live action wraparounds for all the episodes, then he can write all the episodes himself as far as we're concerned. We will not do this. 
And right. Joe backs down, as he should have. But it was not, Ryder didn't have that, I'm part of a team, we're doing the best we possibly can attitude. His was, what can I do to line my pockets? Mm-hmm. And screw them. Why should I care if, if they get residuals or not? Right. And that's the wrong kind of attitude to have when you're in a group setting. It literally, when it comes to television and movies, whether it's animated, live action, CGI, whatever, or combination thereof, it literally takes a village to make it happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when you get somebody who's all focused on me, 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 that's when you have literally a wrench in the system. It slows everything down, it bogs things down, and it turns into a nightmare. Yeah. Because everybody else is working for the whole, and then you got a couple of people, oh, it's all about me, and it's like, no, it's not. <laughs> exactly. It's about the product. It's about the characters and the story, and that's what everybody else is working towards, putting their effort towards. Back to some of the other last few of these, that, uh, at least of TV shows that you've done. Mm-hmm. Following Chip and Dale Rescue Rangers, you have Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Dink the mm-hmm. Dinosaur, Tiny yeah. Toon Adventures, yep. My Little Pony Tales, Conan the Adventurer, which was actually kind of funny for me because I don't remember watching it. But when I went back and watched okay. the opening sequence, mm-hmm. I recognized the characters and I'm like, okay, I did watch this. Mm-hmm. It's just it's been so long. Yeah, you know, it's like I used to watch Hill Street Blues, and the only thing I can remember is the garage door comes up, the police yeah. car comes out, and Hill Street Blues across the screen, and that's all yeah. I remember the show. But I yeah. know I watched it. Yeah. So it's some of the, some shows. It's like, did I watch that? Yeah, I did. I because I well, remember the guys. <laughs> see my name on credits, and I go, oh, I I guess I must have worked on it. I mean, my name's there, but. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I remember working on Dink. I can't tell you for love or money what it was that I wrote. According to this, Krusty's Baby and The Gentle Hunter. Ah, The Gentle Hunter I remember because that was the one about the tyrannosaur that decided to become a scavenger and not a predator. And Uh that was kind of like edgy at the time because we got notes back from the network going, wait a minute, you're eating dead bodies? And it's like, well, the alternative is eating live ones. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> no. But isn't that kind yeah. of gruesome? And I said, well, it's a dinosaur. And it makes sense from a yeah. biological yeah. standpoint. Yeah. Like either you're an active hunter or you're a passive hunter. And a passive hunter yeah. means scavenger. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And then you did Batman animated series, mm-hmm. Cat Scratch I, Fever. I did Cat Scratch Fever, which was based on someone else's, I'm trying to remember her name. I think it was Bo Derek's sister-in-law. I'm, I'm not saying that in a, in a denigrating sense because she's a good writer. That's the only thing I remember right now off the top of my head is that she's related to Bo Derek or was related can't to remember, Bo Derek. Can't think of her name off the top of yeah. your head right now. <laughs> uh, she wrote the basic outline. She wasn't going to have time to do it. I had written a script that they had accepted and paid for and then decided they didn't want to do new villains. They were only going to do established villains. And since I had introduced two new villains, they pushed that one aside. So they gave me as kind of a consolation prize her outline. And I went through the outline. I made changes that fit my style of storytelling, but I kept the basic idea that she had. I didn't go in and rewrite just for the sake of rewriting, but I just knew my approach to a story, the rhythms that I take in a story were were slightly different from the rhythms she would have taken in a story. Right. And I mean, she did a lot of work for them too. I mean, this is not like they gave me something to fix. Quite the contrary. This was already a good idea and they handed it to me. I did one other with Steve Gerber. And I think it's the one where we introduced the Creeper. Steve and I were dear friends. Steve was a great writer, but he always had deadline problems. If, if you remember, one of the most notorious of the original Howard the Duck books was called mm-hmm. Deadline Doom, where, where he basically vamps for the entire book. I've got nothing, folks. What can I tell you? <laughs> Uh-huh. I just filled it up with single page illustrations of all kinds of ridiculous stuff, which ends up coming back. I mean, he does one picture of a uh, Las Vegas showgirl 
and her ostrich fighting a malevolent lava lamp. And he ends up doing a graphic novel years later with just that theme. Las Vegas wow. Showgirl, Ostrich, Malevolent Lava Lamp. I can't remember okay. the name of it right now, and I don't have it out where I can see it quickly, so I can't, I can't <laughs> tell you it. But anyway, Steve wow. had problems hitting deadlines, and on more than one occasion, he asked me if I could come in and help him meet the deadlines. In fact, my break into writing comics was he was doing Destroyer Duck, which was to fund his lawsuit against Marvel over Howard the Duck. He was falling behind schedule. There was a character, there was a subplot. He could break off about two pages as a subplot and give it to somebody else to write. And so he said, would you just write a two-page fight scene for me between these characters? Oh yeah, and Jack Kirby is gonna be drawing it. And I said, well, yeah, of course. So the very first comics work I ever did was drawn by Jack Kirby. It's, it's all been downhill since then. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's that's not a bad first credit to have, you know, artwork no, by no. Jack Kirby. So I did a two-page scene for him in, I think, Destroyer Duck number three or number four. He was having trouble meeting the deadline on his Batman scripts that he was doing. And I mm -hmm. think he had more than one in the works at that time. And so he asked me if I could come in and just do Creeper Story for him. And he, mm -hmm. it was basically, it's the same basic introduction to the Creeper that in the comic book, except it's more Batman-centric this time. So I said, yes, I came in, I wrote it for him. I think he did a light polish on it to fit it into what was being done in the series at that time. I can't remember if both our names on it, or if it was only his name, but as a tribute to Steve, I mean, he saw to it that I, I since I had done all the work, I got the money for it. So he, uh, very scrupulous in that. I'll tell you something about Tiny Toons. The weirdest script I ever sold was to Tiny Toons. I went in to see Paul Dini, who was one of the story editors, pitching ideas, not, didn't even have them written up, just pitching ideas. I said, I'd like to do a story where the Tiny Toons deliver a piano to the tune of the Hungarian Rhapsody. And oh, he I says, write that up. He's, because that's, that's immediately got the whole thing right there. So I went home and I was trying to figure out how to write it up. And I realized you need to be able to do it with the music to explain what's going on. This is back in the days of LPs. I got the Hungarian Rhapsody as an LP. Mm -hmm. I played it a 33 LP. I played it at 45 to pick up the tempo so that it would, it would fill the same amount of time that the cartoon would film. Mm -hmm. And then I recorded myself narrating the cartoon with the music playing in the background. Mm -hmm. Falling, and now they're falling, and now they're tumbling down the stairs, and they're gonna, and, and I just did the whole thing like this. I was like half singing, half speaking the story. And I brought <laughs> in the, the cassette to them, and I said, here you go. And they gave it to the animators, and the animators listened to it, and they animated according to that. I never put word to paper. I just narrated the, the cartoon to the music, the capper was this. Several years later, L.A. Philharmonic did a music of the movies night. They picked that Tiny Toons episode to do a live accompaniment to. C flat or B sharp. Yep. That's, That's the one thing so I'm ticked funny. off at him because they changed it. Aww. It's supposed to be C sharp or B flat. Mm. You see? That's the joke. C yeah. sharp or B flat. And somebody somewhere in their infinite wisdom changed it the other way around. Oh, uh, go. <laughs> it happens, though. <laughs> it does happen. Yeah, yeah, I I remember seeing that one. It was yeah. I was on the floor. I was laughing so hard. <laughs> they were also doing a poetry one. I was arguing so hard for this, and they wouldn't do it. They did one episode where each segment was a comedic interpretation of a classic poem. And I think Buster was supposed to be introducing each segment all dressed up in finery and whatnot. And I mm -hmm. said, you've got to have, what was the duck? Not Daffy, but whatever the duck character was, he's got to come. Ducky Duck? 
Plucky Duck. Plucky Duck, yeah, as, as Buster is making his introduction, Plucky Duck, every time, has got to zoom on stage and say, I saw the best minds of my generation destroyed by madness, starving, hysterical, naked, and then get yanked off Shepherd's Crook. And, and that's the opening line to Howl by, by Allen Ginsberg. Got to have Plucky Duck running out there trying to do Ginsberg. And now nah, they didn't go for it. <laughs> Aw. Well, you know, can't win them all. No. But some of them do get through, and they're funny. Yeah. Like yeah. C-flat B, or B-sharp mm -hmm. is funny as hell. Thank you. It was. Thank you so much. Yeah. Oh, you're welcome. Time. Good night. Good night. Good night.